thank you for uh, being patient enough to wait for my turn. Uh, so today I'll be talking about the evolutionary roots of human decision making. And you'll forgive me if my voice is a bit hoarse, I've had laryngitis and bronchitis for about a month. So uh, before I get into how our biology and our evolutionary past affects our decision making, I'd like to briefly discuss uh, other approaches that have been used in studying decision making. These can be broken up into normative, prescriptive, and descriptive. So a normative approach, this is, this is what classical economists do. Uh, that's why it's called homo economicus. Uh, classical economists argue that for us to make good decisions, we have to behave rationally. And they have a very, very particular way of defining rationality. So for example, the transitivity rule says that if I prefer car A to car B, and if I prefer car B to car C, then I should prefer car A to car C. If I don't, I'm being irrational. Or if you give me a hamburger, and you tell me under one frame that it's 90% fat free, or in another frame that it's 10% fat, those two frames are equivalent, yet people end up having completely different evaluations depending on how it's framed. That would be irrational. So that's exactly what classical economists do. Uh, if you contrast that to prescriptive approaches to decision making, this is where you're trying to prescribe some optimal behavior. So take the classic traveling salesman problem. If I am a salesman who starts at, at uh, city A, and I have to visit cities A, B, C, D, and then come back to A, what is the optimal route that I should take so I can minimize the distance traveled? Or another problem called the two-dimensional cutting stop problem. If I have sheets of metal or glass or wood that I have to cut into smaller parts, how should I cut these so that I minimize the amount of wasted space? So that, those are called prescriptive approaches in the stream. And then finally, descriptive approaches basically describe how people make decisions. That's what psychologists do. So for example, if you are a woman looking for a date and you're choosing between different suitors, you might say, well, I'll choose the guy who scores the highest on my most important attribute. I'm a shallow woman. I only care about good looks. So the guy who is the best looking, that's the guy I go out with. This is called the lexicographic rule. Or alternatively, there's another rule called the satisfying rule. So if again, I'm a woman that's deciding between different uh, men to choose from, I could say, well, the man better be at least six feet tall you better at least make $100,000. If not, I won't go out with them. So I'm setting some minimal thresholds, and I'll only go out with the first guy who exceeds those thresholds. So all of these approaches are lovely and valuable, and we've learned a lot about the psychology of decision making. But what they're all lacking is an understanding of how our biology and our evolutionary heritage affects how we make decisions. And that's the research that I do for the past 20 years. I apply evolutionary psychology to study decision making and consumer behavior. And so I argue basically that there are, these, there are four key Darwinian <laughs> modules that drive much of the important decisions that we make in life. These are broken up to <clears throat> excuse me, survival, so for example, finding good food, avoiding food pathogens, avoiding predators. That would be part of what are called survival problems. Then there's the reproductive module, finding mate, retaining mate, outcompeting rivals. Then there is kin selection. Kin selection refers to anything that deals with uh, families, right? Because my kin share genes with me. And so this refers to any types of investments that relate to those with whom I share genes. And then reciprocity refers to any relationship that involves non-kin. So for example, the friendships that we form, the alliances that we create, all of those fit into reciprocity. So what I'll do for the rest of today's talk is demonstrate how many decision-making uh, tasks that we go through fit into these four specific modules. Let me start with something called the variety effect. It relates to food consumption. The variety effect basically says that we, as omnivores, have to have a variety of nutritional sources. Our physiology requires it. But also, it is a form of reducing the risk of being exposed to food pathogens. If I only eat from one food source, and if that food source is contaminated, then that increases my chances of uh, might be exposed to very dangerous pathogens. By having a diversified strategy, this reduces the likelihood of my facing this problem. Now, it turns out that that original evolutionary mechanism manifests itself today in ways that are quite, quote, irrational. So, for example, if you take uh, single colored M&Ms versus multi colored M&Ms, or single shaped pasta versus multi shaped pasta, even though uh, this manipulation doesn't affect at all the taste. The food coloring is tasteless, it's odorless, yet what do you think happens? People end up eating a lot more from the multicolored bowl 
They end up getting a lot more from the multi-shaped pasta, precisely because it is tricking our brain, it is tricking our visual system to cater to that uh, variety. To give you a few other examples, there's something called intertemporal choice. So if I tell you, uh, would you prefer to have $100 today or wait for two weeks and you'll receive $150? Some people prefer immediate rewards. Other people are willing to wait till later. They're called delayed gratifiers. And what, depending on your personality, it will determine whether you're present or future-oriented. But it turns out that there are some biological cues that I could trigger in you that could change your behavior in this type of task. So for example, if I make you drink a sugary drink, then what that ends up doing, because this now makes you feel satiated, people become more future-oriented. On the other hand, and this only applies to men, not women, if you show men beautiful photos of scantily clad women, they now what's queuing in your head as a man is the mating drive, which is a one of the most potent forces in nature, which needs to be serviced immediately. So men who see photos of beautiful women end up becoming much more present oriented. And so this type of uh, result would not have been uncovered if you didn't understand these basic biological realities. Let's continue. This is a study that I did uh, a few years ago with two of my uh, graduate students where we wanted to look at how much information do men and women look at before they commit to a mate. And we used a computer interface where they could go and you know, acquire information until they were ready to say, okay, I'd like to go out with, with person A or you know, woman X. And what we found is that when it comes to rejecting mates, in other words, when you look at a bunch of mates and they decide, I've seen enough, they're all losers, women <laughs> are, much more, are much quicker in arriving at that conclusion. In other words, they, they, they require less information to be convinced to walk away from mating opportunities. On the other hand, when it comes to choosing mates, women acquire a lot more information prior to, them, prior to committing to a mate. So depending on whether it's a rejection task or a choice task, we see this pervasive sex difference. And that sex difference is rooted in a very basic biological reality, which basically says that the minimal obligatory parental investment for women, if they were to have a child, looms much larger than if for men. And therefore, they have to be more judicious in how they make choices. So this particular decision result could not have been uncovered if you were not coming with an evolutionary understanding. Continuing with this uh, mating, uh, uh, a theme. Uh, if you remember the example I gave with 90% fat free versus 10% fat hamburger, you could apply this exact same framing manipulation in the mating context. For example, you could tell men and women, how likely would you like, to, would you go out with this guy if I tell you that seven out of ten of his friends think that he's intelligent? Which is the same thing as telling you that three out of ten of his friends don't think he's intelligent. <laughs> right? And I can apply this manipulation with many different attributes. So here I have kindness, intelligence attractive body and face, earning potential and ambition. And we did this manipulation on men and women. Who do you think ended up succumbing more to the framing effect? Women a lot more. The reason being that, again, negatively valence information, especially in the mating domain, looms much larger in women's psyche. And so, again, this particular finding would not have been uncovered were you not aware of these basic evolutionary principles. To wrap up, uh, with, with mating things, and then I'll go on to other examples. A few years ago, I did a study with one of my former doctoral students where we studied what are called the ultimatum and dictator games. Let me very briefly tell you what they are. Uh, you bring in two people into the lab, that's called player A and player B. You give $10 to player A, and you ask him or her uh, to split that $10 with player B. So if player A says, I'm going to give $7, uh, I'm going to keep $7, I'm going to give $3 to player B. If player B accepts that split, you give them their respective splits. If player B says, no, I don't accept that split, then they both get nothing. In the dictator game version, player B has no say. Whatever player A says, that's the end of the game. Now, classical economists will tell you what should be the optimal rational behavior in this context. What we were interested in is what happens in this game, in these two games, when you manipulate the sex of the two players. So you have four possibilities. They could be male, 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 female, female, male, and female, female. What we predicted and found is that when player A is a male, his behavior changes radically depending on whether he's facing a woman or a man. When he's facing a man, that's when intrasexual rivalry really kicks in because men compete on resources. 
when he's facing a woman, this is where he is maximally generous because you want to demonstrate that you're willing to share your resources. This is why I always tell people who ask me of dating advice, uh, don't be cheap on a first date, you'll never be a second date. <laughs> <laughs> Even though the woman is perfectly capable of paying for her own dinner, frugality is not a very sexy uh, trait on the dating market. <laughs> On the other hand, for women, irrespective of whether they're playing against men or women, they're equally fair. So this sex difference, again, was very much based on an understanding of these sex-specific differences in the mating domain. Moving on from mating, so I've discussed a few survival examples, a few mating examples. Let's move on to kin and reciprocity. So I'm currently doing some studies, it's not this paper, it's not yet published, with some Israeli psychologists, where we're looking at gift-giving practices at Israeli weddings. Now, why is gift giving an important thing to study? Is because that's where you see a lot of kin investment, right? We give gifts to our family members, we give gifts to friends, and they reciprocate. So, gift giving is a wonderful opportunity to study some of these basic Darwinian modules. And so, what we wanted to study is, well, a couple of things. So, the first thing we wanted to study is, what, how big is the size of the gift? By the way, I should mention that Israeli, the, the norm in Israeli weddings is not to give toasters and coffee machines, is to basically just give money. And so the, the bride and groom typically keep a list of, you know, uh, Uncle Mordechai gave $150, and Hana gave $100. And so we actually have access to uh, these lists of 30 different weddings. And so the first thing we wanted to test is whether the size of the monetary gift, the wedding gift, would be related to the genetic relatedness between the giver and the bride and groom. So, for, so put simply, uh, your grandmother would likely give a larger gift uh, than a uh, second cousin. And that's exactly what we find. I mean, you don't have to look at these histograms too carefully. But the more genetically related you are, the bigger the size of the gift. Now you might say, well, okay, I don't, I don't need to know evolutionary theory to have probably predicted that. And you'd be right. That one is perhaps easy to predict. The next finding that I'm going to discuss is actually very subtle and you would have probably not been able to predict it if you weren't coming from an evolutionary perspective. Take your, your grandparents. All of your four grandparents share on average 25% uh, of their genes with you. So if you were only basing these investment patterns on genetic relatedness, then all of your four grandparents should equally invest in you. But if you realize that it's not just genetic relatedness that matters, but genetic, genetic assuredness, how assured are you of the genetic link? Well, maternal grandmothers are perfectly assured of their link. There is no such thing in nature as maternal uncertainty. But there is such a thing in nature as paternal uncertainty. We, we didn't evolve with DNA paternity tests on the Maury Bovich show. Uh, and so this, this, this worry, this, this threat of paternity uncertainty actually drives a lot of our differences in mating behavior. And so we should expect that women, uh, maternal grandmothers would invest the most. Paternal grandfathers who have two generations of paternal uncertainty would invest the least, and the two other grandparents would invest someone in the middle. And that's exactly what's been found in many cultures, and this is precisely what we found in our own uh, study. The, the, the larger histogram refers to the maternal lineage versus the smaller histogram as the paternal lineage. But this effect was largely driven by grandparents and aunts and uncles. This finding, you would have been very hard, hard pressed to come up with it were, were you not aware of these evolutionary uh, calculus. Now, of course, uh, one of the outcomes of weddings for most people is to increase their reproductive fitness, which is a fancy biological term to say to have children. And so, one of the studies that I'm currently doing uh, with one of my current doctoral students is looking at how baby primes, if I, and I'll tell you in a second why we care about this, if you prime people with photos of babies, or if you prime them to hear babies crying or laughing, what happens to their decision making? What happens to their risk taking? What happens to their conspicuous consumption showing off? What happens to their charitable donations? Now, the reason why we care about babies in particular is for several reasons, but let me give you one. We know that expected fathers, fathers that are about to have children, have a drop in their testosterone when they're expected fathers. And the reason is very simple and elegant. To the extent that men are very much driven by the Darwinian drive of mating, and now you have to reorient your focus 
to parent it dry. I'm about to have a child. I can't spend 90% of my day thinking about sex. And so <laughs> the way to assure that men are going to reorient their Darwinian pulls from mating to parenting is to have a drop in their testosterone because that actually reduces their libidinal drive. And so using that principle, we thought that by having people either primed with faces of babies or hearing babies, this would have a profound effect on how they tackle decisions. And we've started to make some interesting findings. Unfortunately, I don't have the final findings for you because the studies are being run right now. But stay tuned, there should be some interesting findings. Mm -hmm. I should mention that if you're wondering why the top two babies are extraordinarily good looking, <laughs> that's because this proves that very good looks are heritable, and they due to the fact that, I don't know where my wife is, she's somewhat, they're large, these are our children, they're largely due to her with a very small input on my part. <laughs> uh, I'm almost done. Why is it that point? Okay. Uh, so I, I did a study, uh, actually it's an ongoing study, with a uh, former graduate student and a geneticist, Len Shirkus, where we looked at the difference between identical twins and fraternal twins. The fancy terms are monozygotic twins and uh, dizygotic twins. Precisely because monozygotic twins share, on average, all their genes, whereas fraternal twins, on average, share 50% of their genes. They're like regular siblings. And so what we wanted to do is see whether the types of decision styles that people have, whether there is a genetic component to that. And typically, you use these types of twins paradigm when you are trying to disentangle the environment from the genes. And so what we did in two studies is we brought people into the lab and we either administered these uh, psychometric scales that measures one's decision-making style, are you a rational decision-maker, avoidant, impulsive, and so on and so forth. And then we then in study two, we had them actually make decisions where again we kept track of how much information they looked at before they made a choice and so on and so forth. And what we found in both studies is that the scores of the monozygotic twins, the identical twins, were much more similar than those of their dizygotic counterparts. Meaning that there is definitely a genetic component to how we tackle decisions. And again, you would have not been able to conduct such a study if you weren't aware of our genetic reality, our evolutionary history, our biology, and so on. So I'm hoping that what you take away from this thought is not only, oh gee, I didn't know that Kiefer Sutherland had a twin. <laughs> But that maybe you'll take the following away, that yes, prescriptive and normative and uh, uh, what's the other one, the descriptive decision making is, are all valid approaches, but until we incorporate an understanding of evolutionary theory and our biology into decision making, we'll never have a full understanding of why and how we make decisions. Thank you very much.